Okay, let's read then from verse 13 of John chapter 2. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And then we want to turn to 1 Corinthians, which is number 45, Bruno. 1 Corinthians, <coughs> sorry, 46, I think it is maybe, it's maybe 46, yeah, 46. So 1 Corinthians and chapter 15, and we want to read uh, three sections from this glorious, glorious chapter about Christ, the risen Christ. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed, in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to keep us then to the twelve. And then he records other appearances, and we want to go down to verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead.
For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. And then we want to read from verse 55. Um, sorry, we'll read from verse 54. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Well, let's turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. And we want to think this morning about the subject, the resurrection does it matter? Does it matter if Jesus rose again from the dead? What difference does it make to our world and to your life, to my life, and to the life of the church? There are those within the professing church of Christ who say, no, it doesn't matter. Indeed, they do not believe in the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus. They would say to us this morning, it's not the reality of the resurrection, but the idea of resurrection, the thought, the belief, holding to it in your mind, that that is enough without the actuality uh, of the resurrection. What a load of humbug. What nonsense. It would be laughable if it were not so serious. Imagine you were to go home this afternoon and uh, whoever is on dinner duty uh, they, uh, you expect that they're going to be making the final preparations. And so the rest of the family goes and sits or does whatever needs to be done, waiting to be called for dinner. And whoever was making the dinner said, I want you just to think about the roast chicken. Or to think about the roast beef. That's all that is needed. I think you wouldn't be too happy, would you? And you would realize what nonsense that is. That actually when we think about food, the hungrier we get. And to think about food is not the same as the reality of having a good, solid meal in front of us. 
And so I want to say to you that for those who say, well, all we need is the thought of the resurrection. We don't need the actual resurrection. We should say to them, don't bother about the meal. Just think about the meal and see how satisfied they are after a while. We read from John's Gospel. We read from 1 Corinthians 15 this morning, both of which emphasize the actual physical bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. One day he was lifeless because of what happened to him on the cross and three days or on the third day, two days later, he was seen again. And the disciples, uh, a week after that, um, Thomas was able to touch the nail prints in his hand and put his hand into the place where the sword had pierced Jesus' side. They were in no doubt that Jesus had risen from the dead. It wasn't simply a thought or an idea that they were to hold on to in their minds. And so as we answer our question this morning, the resurrection doesn't matter. We want to note what the resurrection signifies and that will show us that it does matter. What's bound up with the resurrection? And that will show us that it most certainly does matter whether it was a reality or just a figment of the disciples and other people's imaginations. And all we need to do today is to hold on to the concept. First of all, let us see that the resurrection signifies the trustworthiness of the Scriptures for our lives. The resurrection signifies that this book that we read from, that I preach from, that we build our lives on as our rule of faith, it tells us what to believe, and our rule of life, it tells us what to do. The resurrection shows us that this book is trustworthy, that you can rely upon it, that it is the actual word of God, that what it says will come to pass in the future will actually happen because the things that it said would happen in the past did indeed happen. And both parts of the scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament, emphasize and teach Jesus would rise from the dead. And the Old Testament spoke of the resurrection of Jesus hundreds of years, um, even millennia before it happened. And Jesus himself spoke of his resurrection several years before it happened. We sang a few moments ago from Psalm 16. And those words, what were they? For you will not leave my soul in the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Those words were written a thousand years before Christ came. They were written by David. They weren't the kind of song that somebody writes today and offers as a worship song. No, this song, with all um, the other 149 songs of the Psalms, 
were inspired by the Holy Spirit. They came down from heaven. That's what the word inspired means. They came down from heaven. God was guiding David in his thoughts and words. And David, um, while he was writing uh, with a measure of freedom, he was being, uh, all things were being overruled by the Holy Spirit. And we know that David's body lies in the grave. And he did not rise from the dead. But he was speaking as a prophet. He was speaking about his son. He was speaking about the seed of the woman promised in Genesis 3. He was speaking about the Christ, the Holy One of God, who did not see corruption in the grave. And we know that that's not just uh, preachers making that up because in Acts chapter 2 Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost uh, that was um, after 50 days after Christ uh, had uh, risen and he wanted to show the resurrection of Christ where did he go to? He went back to Psalm 16 and he brought it into his sermon in Acts chapter 2 and verse 27. So the resurrection matters. Because if the scriptures say it would happen and it did not happen, then the scriptures are not the scriptures. And they're not reliable. And we cannot build our lives upon them and be sure that we are uh, doing right or that we're following God. But on the contrary, the resurrection, when it happened, confirmed what David had written a thousand years beforehand. And then we read there from John chapter 2 where Jesus in the temple uh, at the very beginning of his ministry and how it must have grieved his spirit to go into what is known as the house of prayer and the place of worship, not just for Jews, but for all nations. And to find the Jews buying and selling on uh, in the area of the temple that was reserved for the, for the Gentiles to learn about him. And they were making a handsome profit, these Jews, because they were exchanging money, money, the kind of money that was needed to pay the temple tax. They were selling the, the animals, the birds, the, the goats, the sheep that were needed for the temple sacrifices. Don't you bother bringing one from, from Nazareth or whatever. We'll supply you one when you get there. And they even had the habit of if people brought their own, they would find some fault with it and they'd say, you can't offer that here. You must buy one of ours. Do you know that kind of thing? It still happens today. Um, and not uh, in, in, in life generally. And you see, Jesus was so uh, vexed at this and so overwhelmed that, that this should happen in the house of prayer, the place of worship. He drove them all out. And he said, you're a den of thieves and robbers. Imagine. That must have created some surprise. You're a crowd of robbers and thieves. Get out of here. And then... Of course, they're, um, the, the Jewish leaders, they're taken aback and, and uh, they want to hold Jesus to account. And Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. And of course, he was speaking to the Jews. He said, you destroy my body. You put me to death. You're angry with me. There is a time when you will put me to death. This body uh, this temple where God dwells, 
and I will raise it up again. He was speaking of his resurrection. And did you notice there how when Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples' minds went away back to that first event or that early event and said, that's right. Jesus said, destroy the temple. And in the third day, I will raise my body up again. Brethren, let us rejoice in the resurrection because the resurrection confirms to you and to me and to the church the trustworthiness of the scriptures for our lives. And indeed, the resurrection condemns every church this morning that does not build its life upon the word of God as its rule of faith and practice. And so take these scriptures, read these scriptures, devour these scriptures, knowing that in them you have the very word of the living God. And don't just believe them about the things that have happened in the past, but also what will happen in the future. As we read there in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ will come again. He will come in his glory. He will come like the noonday sun in the sky. He will come with his angels. There will be the sound of the trumpet. And he will be coming to gather his believing people that are still alive from off the earth. But also believing people who have died, their souls will come from heaven with Jesus, down with him, and their bodies will rise from the dead, and body and soul will be joined together again in the worship and service of God in heaven forever and ever. Now, our world scoffs today at the idea of judgment, at the idea that Christ has going to come back again uh, and is going to bring this world to an end, we can be sure, we can be certain if the things that were said about his first coming have come true, the things that are said about his second coming will also come true. And we are to be men and women and boys and girls who are ready for that coming. Because it could happen at any moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He will come, we're told, like a thief in the night, when people least expect him. He will come when people are busy in all the affairs of this world. And as we busy ourselves rightly in work from day to day, let us keep before us the coming of Christ again. So the resurrection signifies the trustworthiness of the scriptures. But then secondly, it signifies the acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. The resurrection, does it matter? Of course it matters. Because we believe from the scriptures that Jesus on the cross... He died not as an accident. He died not because he got on the wrong side of the powers that be and he couldn't resist them and he couldn't avoid death and they eventually all ganged up against him and, as we would say, got him. No. Nor was it a natural death. Jesus didn't die of natural causes, nor was it a deserved death. It was the most undeserved and unwarranted death in human history, past, present, and future. And why was that? Because it was the death of a sinless man. The death of a sinless man the only sinless human being ever to live and the only sinless human being ever to die. So why did he die? 
Well, the scriptures again, the Old and New Testament, tell us um, that it was for our iniquities and our transgressions that he was bruised. Uh, Isaiah 53. And we're told again and again in the New Testament that it is the godly who died for the ungodly. That he died uh, for the salvation of his people. That on the cross, what he did was he took the sin of his people and he took it to himself as if it was his sin. And so, during those six hours of darkness, Jesus was experiencing the wrath of God, not for his own sin, but for the sins of his people. To the very point that he cried out, My God, my God, why is your face turned away from me? The Father's face had to be turned away from Christ those hours that he was on the cross because he was a sinner. Not in his own right, but in your stead, in my place. And so at the end of the six hours, Jesus said, it is finished. And that's not the, the gasping last breath of a dying man. My life's over. No. Salvation, sacrifice is finished. The provision of salvation is finished. I have accomplished it. And now, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands. You see, though Christ was experiencing anguish in his body, and though he was experiencing hell in his soul, he was completely in control on that cross, knowing exactly what he was doing at every point until he breathed his last. And so that's the teaching of Scripture about Jesus' death, that it was for our sins. But here's the question. How can we know that God accepted his sacrifice for our sins? How do we know that he actually was dying for our sins in the first place. Is that not maybe just something that the church has built in over the years? No. The proof is in the resurrection. In the resurrection. Christ died for our sins, Romans 4 verse 25, and rose for our justification. So the proof that God has accepted his payment for your sin and my sin is in the risen Christ. That was God saying, I've accepted it. This man didn't need to die, but this man died for you. And this man has risen for you for your salvation. And so the resurrection doesn't matter. Of course it does. Because if it's only some kind of thought that people have in their head and it didn't actually happen, then as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, you are still in your sins. There's no salvation without a crucified Christ and also without a resurrected Christ. And that's why in the New Testament, the crucifixion and the resurrection are always spoken about in the same breath. There are two sides of the coin of salvation. And you and I do not have salvation in Christ crucified alone. We have salvation in Christ crucified and Christ risen on the third or raised on the third day. If Christ is not risen, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, your faith is futile. 
You are still in your sins. Could it be simpler? Could it be clearer? No, it couldn't. And so let us rejoice today in the resurrected Christ because it says to you who believe in him and who have turned from your sin, your sins are forgiven. Forgiven forever and ever and ever. God will not call you to pay for what his son has already paid for. That would be completely unjust. Imagine if you got a bill that you'd already paid a second time and you're asked, please pay this bill. And you say, I paid that bill last week. What are they at? You'd be, you'd be incensed, wouldn't you? Well, we don't need to be incensed with God because God is completely just and righteous. And the payment made once by Christ written over your sin and my sin as we believe in Christ, are the words paid in full and paid forever. Paid forever. So it matters. But then let's notice thirdly, uh, does the, resur the resurrection, does it matter? Yes, it matters uh, because uh, or, uh, the resurrection signifies the work of, the working of God's mighty power in us. In us. And indeed, for us. This is just astounding, so it is. And it's the Apostle Paul who brings out this whole aspect of the resurrection of Christ. That power that Jesus exercised of himself in rising from the dead the power that the Father exercised in him and raising him from the dead, that is the very power that is at work in you and in me. Whoa! That just blows my mind. Blows my mind. So here we are this morning as men and women who confess Christ and we are called as born again women and men and boys and girls to do what? To live a holy life. And rightly we say, of myself I cannot do it. And the non-Christian who when you share the gospel with them says, I cannot do it. They are right. They are right. And you should say to them, you're completely right in that. You cannot do it. You cannot live a life without sin. You cannot live a life that is pleasing to God. You cannot live a life whereby it is becoming more and more like the life of Jesus. You can't do it by yourself. But you can do it in Christ in him, the power of Christ that is at work in the believer, the power that has already made us alive from our sin and has made us new creatures. That's not a momentary power that is there for a moment, that moment of regeneration and then, well, we're freewheeling or we're peddling like mad to get home. No, it's like one of those electric bikes, okay? And you've got an electric bike, and you've got it up in the top level of, of um, assistance from the battery, and you're turning the pedals. And people could be driving by and saying, boy, she's really going. She's powering on. And the reality is, it's not you. It's the battery in the bike. And you see, that's what it is to be a Christian. It's the power of God in us. It's the Holy Spirit in us who is turning the wheels and turning the pedals in our lives. Yes, we are involved as well. 
Uh, but we are, we are making progress uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit that is working within us. And you see, that's why Paul emphasizes the resurrection of the Christ here. Because his victory um, and his power um, is at work in us. Look at verse 31 uh, where he says, um, um, I affirm uh, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? The dead do not rise. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good manners. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But you see, that power of God that raised Christ, that's the power that awakes you and me to righteousness. So that we know we are to live differently. We know we are to remember the Sabbath day and to set it apart from other days. It's the day when we don't do our works, but we focus on the works of God. We know that we are not to kill, we're not to steal, we're not to covet, and we uh, take the power of Christ when we are tempted to do those things and we overcome the sin that is within us. Paul talks about that struggle in Romans chapter 7 and 6 between good and evil because we still remain in sin and it's only by the power of Christ's resurrection that we're able to overcome. Paul in Philippians chapter 3 will say, he'll write, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. That's what we had this morning in our call to worship. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20. Paul's praying that they would know the exceeding greatness of what? Of God's power towards us who believe which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and which he works in you and me so that we die to sin and we live to righteousness. The resurrection, does it matter? It most certainly does. Because without that resurrection power of Christ at work in my heart and my life, doesn't matter how hard I try, doesn't matter how many resolutions I make, doesn't matter how many times I turn over a new leaf, doesn't matter what self-denial I, uh, I go through um, or what scourging of the body, I will not overcome sin without the resurrection power of Christ <coughs> at work in us. Finally this morning then, the resurrection doesn't matter. We've seen that it signifies the trustworthiness of Scripture for our lives, the acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. It signifies the working of God's mighty power in us, and I haven't really dealt with for us, but that, go to Romans chapter 8 if you want to think about that. And then finally, um, the victory over the wages of sin. The victory, it signifies the victory over the wages of sin. And what are the wages of sin? Misery and death. Physical death, spiritual death, eternal death. And so um, we're told and we're taught in Scripture, and Paul writes about it here, the death of Jesus was swallowed up in what? In 
victory. Victory. And who was that victory for? That victory was for you and for me, for the people that the Father had given him in eternity. His victory is the victory of everyone who believes in him. Paul talks here about the first fruits, so he does, of the resurrection. And that is Christ. And then you and I, um, we experience that victory in Christ. That victory not only over sin, but over the misery that sin causes. And so in our lives, we've done things and we've said things and we've thought things that have produced misery in our lives. And yet as we look to the Lord, he's able to turn that misery round and he's able to bring blessing and he's able to bring good out of it. Think of the things that happened to Joseph, the misery he experienced in that pit the misery he experienced when he was taken to a land, the language of which he didn't know. The misery he experienced when Potiphar's wife uh, lied against him. The misery he experienced uh, when he was forgotten about in the prison by the butler. But you see, God turned all of that to good. Over those 13 years, and so we can look back in our lives and we can see the years of misery, the years of perhaps barrenness when we haven't followed Christ as we ought to have, though we have professed him. And you see, if we look to Christ in the midst of where we're at now, he's able to make those years and those experiences fruitful. He's able, as we read in the prophet, to restore the years that the locusts have devoured and eaten in our lives. And he's able to make us useful in his kingdom so that the things that we've done, uh, that we do for him, those are things that last forever, that will re experience his reward on the last day. And so the resurrection, it signifies the victory, the victory of the last day. Oh, I love reading those words of Paul's at the graveside when there's a burial going on uh, and you're standing at an open grave and um, a believer has been placed in that grave and those words of Paul, um, O oh death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? You've no victory, sin. You've no victory, Satan. You've no victory, grave. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How wonderful. How wonderful. Does the resurrection matter? It most certainly does. Because if Christ did not rise from the dead, you will not rise from the dead, and I will not rise from the dead. If Christ did not rise from the dead, there's no heaven. And we might as well do as what Paul says here, eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And we're, deci we're deceived, and we're the most miserable of people. <coughs> but no, we're not. We're the most joyful of people. We're the most happy of people. We're the most hopeful of people. Why? Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees our victory over sin, over death, over the grave, and entry into heaven to be with Christ. And so what can I say to you then in the light of that? I can only say to you, as Paul does at the end of the chapter, my beloved brethren, don't allow the unbelieving world to rock your boat. Don't allow these sophisticated theologians in the church who say, 
It's not the reality of the resurrection. It's the thought of the resurrection that counts. No, as Paul says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Be steadfast. Have a backbone of iron. Be immovable. Don't be blown about by the things that you hear or see in the world or from the church. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. He says, always be busy in the work of Christ. Why? Because we know that our labor is not in vain in Christ. The resurrection, it does matter hugely. It matters eternally. And if anyone listening now or later is not a believer, you need to face up to the death of Christ for sin and the resurrection of Christ for all the reasons that we've thought about this morning. Otherwise, you will live and you will die and you will be raised from the dead when Christ comes again, but not to glory, not to victory, but to defeat. You'll not go to heaven, either in your soul when you die or in your body when Christ comes again. Sadly, you will go to hell where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Whether you're young this morning or old this morning, you need to repent of your sin. You need to trust in Christ for its forgiveness and experience his victory. Mighty power at work in you, building your life upon the scriptures, for they are shown to be trustworthy by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Amen.